Okay, tēnā koutou katoa. I hope everybody can hear me and I hope everyone's been able to relax to the sound of birdsong thus far. Um, we appreciate you making the time to join us today. Uh, given the evolving COVID situation, we understand obviously that priorities and pressures can change promptly. Um, I will begin today with a karakia. Kia tau ngā mana ki tanga a te mea ngaro, ki runga, ki tēnā, ki tēnā o tātou. Kia mahia te hua makihikihi, kia toi te kupu, toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te reo Māori. Kia tūturu, ka whakamaua ki a tēnā, tēnā. Hui e, tai e ki e. So just a few, a few very quick notes from me as we start this session. Just a reminder that the session is being recorded and as noted in the invitation, um, acceptance and attendance is deemed as permission to use um, any part of the recording and publish online for the commission. Um, that includes any of the comments made in the chat thread today. Um, we did initially expect we would open the floor for discussion, but given the large number of people attending, uh, we'll rely on the, the Q&A um, via the chat function. Um, and uh, an open discussion won't necessarily be possible. I can't see everybody on the screen, so I won't know if you're trying to get my attention. Um, and I'm aware that some of you may not have that function available if you're joining from a meeting room. So if you have questions that aren't covered, please feel free to email them to me afterwards. Uh, when you are sending questions, obviously we've left the chat function open so everyone can message everybody else. Um, if you're able to put a cue or question in front of your comment, that would be really useful so I can see them clearly and differentiate them from the other comments in the thread. And then I can collate those and I'll present those to Ange after she's finished her presentation. Um, if you're res responding to other people as well, you can use the at mention function to respond specifically or message them privately as well. Um, so I'll, I'll collate those questions during the presentation, present them on your behalf. If you want to put your name against them, that would be great. If you have any questions, um, I will change my name tag. So I've got my mobile number on there for tech issues if you need them, if you need it. Um, and I will do my best to get through those questions. Um, anything we don't get to today, we will collate and we will um, write up a question and answers sheet and we will um, circulate that as well uh, after the session. We'll also share our contact details and Angie's slides and the link to the recording will come out once it's ready. So now I will hand you over to Leona, Dr. Leona Dan for introductions. Kia ora Jane. And a mana and a reo and a hohifa tēnā koutou katoa. Ko rūnuhini, pai maunga, ko manawatū ti awa, ko manawatū ti papakainga. Ho wahini whakawhānau aho. Ko Leona Dan, toka ingoa, tēnā koutou katoa. So greetings everyone, thank you. My name is Leona Dan and I'm a nurse and a midwife and I work at the Commission as a specialist for patient safety. That means I get to work across lots of various programs and projects, including areas of high harm such as pressure injuries and falls. And I really want to um, just carry on from Jane and acknowledge and thank you for joining us today. This is our inaugural Let's Discuss session, so we will do some, some more of these in the future. They are hopefully informal enough for you to be able to ask us questions through the chat function. Um, and I also want to recognize that for many of you, starting your day today was quite different to how you went home last night thinking your day today would be. So I acknowledge for many of you that is different. Um, and also for those that wanted to attend today, but because of uh, the pandemic uh, following on our heels, they are unable to attend because of other commitments and just reiterate the use of the video in the future to share. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting Ange Dixon last year and I've been able to keep in touch with Ange over time and hear about some of the work that she leads at Counties Manukau. I've, it's been really helpful for me as I've moved predominantly from a midwifery uh, career through to understanding uh, some of the high harm and understanding about pressure injuries and Ange has been really helpful in teaching me lots over that time. And um, there were many case studies that she shared with me and that we could have picked today. Uh, so today I think you'll really enjoy the one that she's going to share. So without any more, I would just like to welcome Ange Dixon. She's here, as you can see. She is our Wound Care Clinical Nurse Specialist for Pressure Injury Prevention at Counties Manukau Health. Kia ora, Ange. Hi everyone. I'll just um, share the screen, bear with me. Uh, 
Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about um, a case study of a patient that I um, have worked with uh, quite closely over the last six months um, and I've entitled it The Whole of the Patient. So talking about the importance of the patient and the healing of chronic pressure injuries. Um, I'm just learning te reo at the moment so I thought it would be a good opportunity to practice my pepeha. So <laughs> bear with me everybody. Uh, tēnā koutou kato, te uh, ko takituma te waka, ko motupuhia te manga, te uh, ko te ara i kiwa uh, um, moana, te rau araha tumarai, ko ki tahu te hapu, ko Pam Taylor tok, uh, toku whaia, ko John Taylor toku mātua. Eno nga... Um, E noho ana aho ki Tamaki Makoto, ko Ange Dixon taku enoa, um, no te rai tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou ta, uh, katoa. So um, I basically just said that I originate from Bluff <laughs> in South Island uh, and I live uh, in New Zealand. My mountain that I identify with is not so much of a mountain, it's a hill, Bluff Hill. And um, the beautiful te rau araha marae down in Bluff is where I um, identified my marae. So let's let's talk about uh, the patient. So um, I wanted to kind of talk to you all about, um, you know, like this little, this little adventure that we call life. And I wanted to um, just talk about the fact that, you know, you go through life and you expect, you know, to have a happy ending um, to everything. Thing that you do and and I just wanted to kind of bring back and and get you guys to just think a little bit about imagine having a pressure injury for not one but two years and how would that make you feel uh, you know they're incredibly painful um, you know they can be smelly they can be um, you know like highly exudating quite embarrassing so it's really kind of about what what would your life be like if you had to make every single decision that you that you did and determine what your events of every day would be based on a wound it's something that starts to govern govern your life and um kind of takes over your life and that becomes what it's like so today i'm going to share uh, with you a patient's story and um he's had a patient he's had his pressure injury for over two years and um and spoiler alert it's a happy ending so that's that's a good one um, so I wanted to just say that meeting patients is one of the, the most favorite parts of my job. Um, hearing their stories, finding about um, how they came to be, um, you know, at counties and how they, um, you know, just meeting people is a privilege. And um, I am a wound care specialist, so obviously a lot of the times that I meet patients, they're in a lot of pain. And so it's not always um, a pleasant experience for them. And I found that that connectedness and that talking and asking them questions can really break down some of those barriers and, and sometimes is an excellent distraction technique for when they are in really large amounts of pain. So that's something that um, I, I like to put into um, my everyday practice. Now, I first got involved with Mr. A when he... Uh, when one of the district nurses contacted me about him, she was a little bit concerned um, by his wound. And his name definitely sounded familiar to me, um, but I, I didn't really remember him. And as soon as I saw him in clinic, I saw his huge smile and I remembered his story and it all kind of came flooding back. And I think that that definitely was a fantastic opportunity for both of us because it made things a little bit easier for him because we'd already met, we'd already learned that kind of, um, learned about one another um, and it meant that he kind of felt like there was somebody on his side and so I think that that really contributed to the success of this uh, interaction. Um, so he was a 50 year old male from Samoa. He's a T6 spinal um, cord injury. He fell from a tree uh, when he was in Samoa when he was 19 years old. Uh, he's an Asia A, um, complete spinal, so he has um, bowel and bladder specificity. Um, he, he's a really friendly and very outgoing person, you know, like he's very, um, the glass is half full kind of, kind of guy. 
um, very, very social. He lives in a, um, a House in New Zealand home that he's lived in for 17 years. Uh, he's very independent. The house is completely outfitted for him and uh, he's very independent. He's got a wonderful supportive family. He, um, you know, he's always out and about. He's just a really social character. Really, really nice guy. Um, he was visited by the district nurses um, like every, I guess every second day for his pressure injury and he would do self cares in between. He also, they would also routinely um, change his uh, suprapubic catheter. So he was, um, he, he had a lot of um, support in that type of thing, but he would often self care for his own dressings because you know, he was a social kind of guy. He wanted to go out and about and, you know, do things in his day. And he didn't really want to have to wait around all day for the district nurses to come. So his, one of his key things was he just was super happy to help out. And if he could do, you know, self-care for his dressings, then he was more than happy to do that for him. Um, so, yeah, he just, he, he liked to be out and about. I think that's really important about him, that he was really, really social. Um, I remember one of the really kind of key things is that he um, he talked to me about how incredibly frustrated he was by his journey, about how um, he'd had this this wound for over two years and it started kind of define him and he was unable to kind of do the things that he wanted to do. He started withdrawing a little bit more. So someone who went from being really social, outgoing, out and about was always, um, you know, like going somewhere or doing something now started to modify that behavior because he was he just his wound was so unpredictable he didn't know what was going to happen from from moment to moment was it going to leak was someone going to you know smell a wound odor he just really it was it was one of those things where his wound after two years had kind of almost broken his spirit and he was getting very very despondent and he just he felt very helpless and hopeless and he didn't know what to do the district nurses had tried everything, every plethora of dressing product you could imagine that had bat, bat dressings on him. They tried, you know, antimicrobials, they've tried, um, you know, moisture management, everything had been done, but unfortunately, um, they weren't able to heal this pressure injury. Now, during this time, he was up in his chair, he was still doing his, his every day-to-day -day activities, but he did modify some of that behavior and did try and stay on his bed and keep it but um, I always like the Albert Einstein saying that's there. So insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So, you know, keep applying the VAC, keep doing all those things. But if you don't modify some of the behaviors or change in some way, then you can't actually um, achieve the goal. And obviously the goal for him was healing, getting his life back and getting back on track. So, I mean, he was seen by pretty much every service imaginable. He'd been seen by the acute spinal rehab unit. Um, he'd been seen by general surgeons. Um, and he, he basically just was feeling really helpless and hopeless. And he needed some sort of, um, some sort of modification uh, to figure out what it was uh, to, to finally get it on the, on the road to recovery. So what was it that changed this time for him? Well, I got the e initial email from the district nurses. They were quite concerned about his wound because the um, wound entrance had collapsed. And uh, as a result, they had to stop back therapy. And since stopping back therapy, they'd noticed that there'd been um, det like larger deterioration and that his cavity was getting bigger and bigger. Um, as a result, we're very lucky at counties. We have a complex wound care clinic that runs on a, a Monday and a Thursday and so I was able to force book him in for urgent review to that so he waited two days and he was able to be reviewed in our complex room care clinic um, and then I we're, we're also very lucky at counties because we have really a lot of great consultants that are very approachable and that it makes it very easy so I was able to identify who his previous surgeon was and I was able to um, just let them know of my concerns so when I reviewed him in clinic, um, his wound was about three centimetres wide by two centimetres wide. It's an ischial um, stage four pressure injury. When I probed it, it was seven centimetres deep and I could feel um, his bone. So obviously my first instance was I was concerned that he had osteomyelitis and I wanted him to be reviewed. So when I contacted the consultant, she was more than happy 
um, for him to come in as a planned admission. And so within four hours of him um, coming to the clinic, uh, he was actually waiting at a ward to be admitted onto, uh, into the ward for review. The following day, he was taken to theatre. They were able to do a debridement um, on him and they um, took some bone biopsies and they determined, in fact, he did have osteomyelitis in his ischial and his pubis ram. So um, it was on his right side where the pressure injury was. So we were able to get him some antibiotics. Um, he had six weeks IV antibiotic therapy, just orals. And um, I guess this is very much where um, kind of the hard part of the journey began for, for us because we had to try and convince an outgoing social 50 year old that he um, you know, might need to be confined to a bed for a period of, of strict bed rest because offloading pressure is one of the you know, clinically best gold standard things to do for these chronic pressure injuries. So um, this had actually been discussed with him before by the um, acute spinal rehab consultant. Um, and it was something that he kind of said, no, he wasn't ready to do. That was something he wasn't willing to consider um, because um, he just, it just seems quite extreme and he, he felt like there was just better ways of dealing with it. So um, during his hospital admission, um, I visited him like quite a lot of times and very early on the piece, we started talking about what the spinal consultant had recommended and that actually best practice would be for him to have um, strict bed rest. And um, he, he kind of opened up a little bit to talk about why he was hesitant about having um, bed rest. He talked about the fact that he has had his own, um, his own house with Housing New Zealand for 17 years. And when they said that you have to go to a rest home, he kind of thought that that would mean that that was it for him, that he was going to be, uh, he would lose his house and then he wouldn't have a home anymore. And so, you know, like when they were recommending that, it was a really scary thing for him. So I think that, um, you know, that it's a very realistic concern when you've been in your own home for 17 years and you're used to your environment, it must be incredibly scary to be told, you know, that you need to leave that safe place and go and, and spend some time in a place that you're not familiar with and you have no idea on um, how they do things and you're going to depend heavily on, on them. So we talked to the social worker and the social worker was able to come in and kind of ease, ease his mind on several of these, of, of this concern particularly. Um, so, and, and kind of ease his mind so that he understood that that wasn't actually going to be the reality, that he wasn't going to lose his home and that it was a period of rehab rather than him kind of giving up his 17 you know, year old house uh, and then going in there and then having to find something else afterwards. So I think that was quite helpful to him. Um, kind of another, another thing that um, I found along the way is that when he talked to me about the self-caring that he did, um, I was I was asking him to explain how he would do it, and I was like, "Can you actually see your wound? Have you got any idea what it looks like, or or what to do?" And he's like, he, he, "I take photos of it." He's like, and I'm like, "But can you see it?" Because I'm, you know, an able-bodied person. I do not think that I could change a dressing on an issue of pressure injury. It's in a very difficult kind of place. And he said that yeah, he he uses his phone a lot to find the placement of the the pressure injury and he also feels for it and then that's how he um he covers it up and does the dressing so um things were kind of starting to make a little bit of sense for me um so we we talked a little bit more so i i kind of liken him to having to be a bit of a contortionist to like contort his body around to to try and and put a dressing on uh like and to get a good seal um, obviously, when we they weren't expecting him to do back dressings, but you know, like even putting something simple like a um, Aquacell foam adhesive on and getting a really good seal without being able to see that area is a complete challenge in itself, um, if you ask me. So um, I also started talking to him about his his bowel and his bladder um, habits, and and he talked to me about the fact that he. Um, you know, initially had a lot of trouble with an, an indwelling catheter 
uh, and then they'd given him his SBC and things had been a lot better for him. He still sometimes got a little bit of penal, uh, penal leakage uh, of urine, but otherwise he felt like the SBC was a really good um, thing for him and it got routinely changed. Um, and when we started talking about his bowel, so remember he's an Asia A, so he needs assistance with both. And we started talking about his bowels and he said that even though he doesn't have a, he doesn't have sensation, sorry, he doesn't have feeling uh, in his bowel, he has a sensation. So he definitely knows when his bowels need to open. And so he does manual evacuations um, over a toilet using a commode. And he just gets a sensation that his, his rectum is full and that he needs to go to the toilet. So he will take himself to the toilet and manually evacuate. Um, he started telling me that sometimes that was like two or three times a day. He would get that sensation and he would empty himself out and that, that would be fine. So I guess um, this confused me a little bit because um, every spinal patient that I know has quite a robust um, bowel regime and I was um, kind of concerned that there might be an element of cross-contamination because of the location of the ischium to his rectum. Um, I thought that there could be some sort of cross-contamination. So I contacted the um, one of the CNSs at the acute spinal rehab unit, and she says that some bowel, um, some spinal patients do have bowel regimes that are, are like once or twice a day, um, but they tend to settle on like once a day, um, and it's and they're usually quite predictable. So that was kind of another thing that I thought was um, something that could could be worked on um, if if we could find a different setting for him. And, um, and it was definitely my, my aha moment because I felt like it definitely was something that was contributing to the chronicity of his wound. And, and I felt very confident that if we could modify these two areas that we could have success with healing his wound. Now, um, it's, you know, it's one of those things, you know, like if you're an independent um, person, then taking something away that you have... Um, full autonomy of it is quite difficult as well. And so I, I was very mindful that I needed to be very cautious about the way that I approached him because I didn't want to disable him. I didn't want him to not feel like he was independent. And, you know, I just wanted him to, um, you know, give an opportunity to trial this and, and see if, if someone else um, doing a manual evacuation or something for him could eliminate that potential of cross-contamination. So I kind of thought it was going to be a super hard sell. I thought I was really, really going to have to work on him quite consistently. But I think because he'd already been in hospital for five days, he'd been on bed rest. Um, you know, like we've, we'd have been reviewing the wounds and talking quite positively about the way that they were looking. He'd kind of, he'd just been told that he had osteomyelitis. So he knew that it was a bit more serious than perhaps he thought uh, in the long run. And he also had, his daughters had come over, one lives in Australia, um, had come over to Australia to be with him on this journey and his sister was there as well. So he was really wrapped in support from his family. And I think that they did a lot of talking uh, when we weren't in the room and kind of like really um, kind of coaching him on and giving him lots of support and saying that, you know, like what, whatever you have to do, you should do because, you know, this is really impacting your life negatively and you want to get on with your life. So I think that when I finally just said out loud that I think that the most positive way to address his pressure injury and to get it to heal would be strict bed rest for a period of at least six weeks in a, a private hospital that had capacity to do back dressings on him and also were able to, um, they were able to manage his manual evacuation. So I kind of lay it all out for him, let him mull it over, talk to his family, kind of talk everything about it. And I mean, he'd called me back within an hour and said, okay, how do we do this? So he had jumped on board really quickly and I think that it had a lot to do with the fact that we had been really talking it through over, over the way and talking really positively about that and a lot of positive visualization as well. I'm like, where do you want to be at? You know, like what is it that you want for yourself? And he's like, I just want my life back. I just want to get back in my chair and be able to go and do the things that I want to do um, without worrying about my wound. So, um, it was, it was a really easy sell in the end. Um, 
So we, we have a virtual wound care clinic here at Counties. It's been going for three years. The clinic itself, um, it gets referred from district nurses, um, the ARC facilities within our area. Um, we have uh, GPs that contact us. We have like a lot of ways of people feeding in, but essentially there's a virtual clinic form that they fill in. And that is how we, um, that is how we like, find the patients for the clinic. And then they give us comprehensive photos. We provide assessments uh, of that and then provide recommendations for treatment plans for them. Um, it's been working very, very successfully. And it'll, definitely in the last year, it's uh, increased in capacity, but it's also a really fantastic um, way of supporting art facilities. So we also have a discharge policy um, which was created by my colleague, um, Penny McCauley. So it's like discharge um, with VAC to private hospitals. So it's a pathway where we tap into some funding from um, POAC and we're able to provide consumables uh, as well as um, funding for patients to be in VAC therapy. Um, so it makes it a bit more favorable for the um, art facilities because it means that they are uh, given funding and it's not something that they have to um, self-fund and particularly um, with Mr. A because he was a uh, he was it was a temporary thing it was always going to be for a, per a period of rehab um, initially six weeks so we had um, we had kind of spoken to we'd spoken to him about it, he was on board. So then we just had to find a private hospital that had availability and that could cope with um, his needs. Um, we were, we're really lucky because we have the virtual clinic, we have like good relationships with um, the art facilities. And, and so we were really, really lucky. The social worker found us um, a, one of the um, private hospitals that had availability for him. And we were able to basically within maybe four days, uh, we got all the paperwork sorted out and he was able to, um, the manager from the facility came in and he met with Mr. A and he talked about um, kind of the environment that he would be in. And he was, um, the patient was still really kind of concerned because he is, although he has beautiful English, he's quite a shy, um, speaker of English and so he was really worried about going into an environment where he didn't have people that spoke someone and he didn't have um, people that he could kind of interact with so he felt that it was going to be really boring for him that he was going to be very much alone and that it was it was going to be quite a hard call for him so the um, the clinical manager of the rest time was able to reassure him that they did have some someone speakers that um, that they were more than happy for his family to come in and see him and spend time with him. And they kind of just talked about the process. And I think that kind of meet and greet really made it a lot easier because then he knew someone um, when he left um, to go to the private hospital. And he also just kind of had a pre-understanding of what would happen and that his family were allowed to come and see him. And, um, and I think that that really works really well. So within kind of four days, he was um, being transferred to his new um, bed rest private hospital for a period of six weeks. So um, that was going really, really well. And then lovely COVID hit. <laughs> so he'd been there for one week <laughs> and I had promised him that he was going to have his family visiting him all the time. It was going to be a social hub for him and it was going to be great and then no one could have predicted what happened um, with COVID and going into level four and then and then last night we went into level three so you just never know when these kind of things are going to hit um, and and he was very understanding about it uh, I think that he I think that it made it a lot more difficult for him because obviously he didn't have that daily contact um, thank goodness we live in a modern world. He has a modern phone and he was able to Zoom, Zoom or FaceTime his family. So he still had that contact with them. But um, it, it definitely made, you know, the next few weeks really, really difficult for him. Um, and then I received a phone call that I kind of thought was coming, but I didn't, you know, I didn't want to have. And that was a phone call from his sister. So 
basically he was four weeks in. He was bored beyond belief. He was absolutely <laughs> sick of being on his on his um on his side from side to side he just said that it was so hard and he didn't want to do it he he was he'd asked his sister to call me because obviously he's not confident with his english and he really just wanted her to to convince me that it was time for him to come home um so i i kind of explained to him or i explained to his sister that the process of uh, the virtual clinics means that every week they send me an updated photo with wound dimensions and I can really kind of keep an eye on it. So I could confidently tell him that his seven centimetre cavity had decreased to um, four and a half centimetres at that time. So I said that he just needs to stay the course. Like he, he was doing so well, he was doing all the right things. And a result of that was that the depth of that wound. Now you think of that, that's four weeks for a depth of, you know, three and a half centimetres to that's that's phenomenal wound healing so kind of our little my theory of the fact that he was contaminating his wound um seemed like it was right because when we removed those kind of modifiable risk factors away from him we saw positive results and because he wasn't sitting on his wound and causing additional pressure then it definitely um progressed quite quickly um so his sister basically said to me He's, he's, she's like, well, if you think that it's working for him, he will stay. And, and that was kind of the end of it. He never um, said another word about it and he stayed for that six weeks. Um, and, and then at the six weeks, his wound still wasn't healed. Uh, and so we had to have another difficult conversation with him to say that basically it's, it's progressing very positively. We're really happy with the way that it's going, but we need to, um, extend the period of POAC to see if we could get results. So he was pretty open to that. I thought that it was going to be another tough sale because two weeks earlier he had definitely told me that he, you know, through his sister that he didn't want to be there anymore. And so adding another, like doubling the time just seemed like a really mean thing to do. But with the positive results that he had seen um, and the way that his wound was progressing, then I was convinced that it was the right thing to do. And he, I think that he also knew in his heart of hearts that it was getting better because the pain was reducing and the, uh, there was no more odor. So he was really kind of, okay, I can do that. Cause you know, always looking to the future, always looking to the goal that in fact, he, he wants to be back up in his chair. He wants his life back. And that's, if, if it means that he takes six, another six weeks out of his life to get that, he was willing to have that. So um, I, I put up some gory slides. I probably should have done a prefacer, but um, you kind of look at his wound. It's a three centimeter by, it was two centimeters. It's a difficult wound because it's a posterior cavity. So this is what um, the first picture is what his wound was like uh, when I first met him. And that was obviously seven centimeters deep um, going onto bone. And um, after his six weeks in POAC, on week seven, his wound uh, entry collapsed. And obviously I was fearful that he had had another collapse at the front and that there was a cavity in behind it. Um, and we had recommended that the GP do an ultrasound because we were quite cautious. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to report that it just was time for him to heal. And so two weeks later, he was fully healed. Uh, he had a little bit of de dry debris on the wound and so we were able to talk to the spinal unit. The plan for him, because he's a spinal patient, a T6, was always that he would need a period of um, rehab at the acute spinal rehab unit where they could do wound, um, they could do pressure mapping and really make sure that they put the most appropriate pressure relieving surfaces on for him and that they were able to give him um, you know, like tools and resources so that he understood what he needed to look for. He understood kind of the safe amounts of time that he could be in his chair for um, before he needed to spend time on the bed and how many hours that would be. So he's actually um, left the spinal unit now. He spent uh, three weeks there. So all up, it was a 12-week journey for him, but it was a nine-week um, 
from a seven centimeter cavity to a healed cavity. So and that's really exciting because he definitely stayed the course. Um, I think that one of the things that's really important to recognize is that this wasn't able to happen without, um, you know, Mr. A, the patient at the first, first and foremost, you know, he, it was patient centered care all the way. Everyone was focused on his kind of recovery. And there were so many different disciplines that worked with him, you know, from the surgeons to the nurse specialists to the private hospital who did phenomenal wound care. And, you know, they were so wonderful with their turns and keeping him on strict bed rest. Um, he's a super nice guy. So one week after he'd healed, he convinced them to let him up in his chair, but we quickly nipped that in the bar. <laughs> and we told him he had to get back in his chair until we went to the acute spinal rehab, um, which he was like, oh, it was worth a try. So, um, yeah, the acute spinal rehab were fantastic with him as well because he was able to reintegrate and he really understands and was given a lot of resources and tools to to kind of look what to look for uh, and and how long it is to stay safely reintegrated into his chair. They kind of realised that in fact he does need a little bit of extra support. So he's he definitely his wound is fragile um, because obviously it's only. Uh, and it's, first, it's, it's it's in its first two months of um, of healing. So he does need to have extra support. So he he now has caregivers that go in and assist him with um, showering and transferring so that he's not doing any sliding or shearing on his fragile wound. Um, but he is incredibly happy and and he understands that, you know, like a nine week sacrifice, it turned out to be a 12 week sacrifice. But once he got to the spinal unit, he really felt like it was just all, all over for him. He was just like, I'm so close to home. I can practically see it and I'm, you know, very excited. So it was very much about uh, a combined effort. And I think that that's one of the most important things to think about is that when, when you've got a chronic wound, is there something that people just are missing? You know, the fact that he was doing self-care and the fact that he was doing manual evacuations in an area that's quite uh, intimate and that there is potential for cross-contamination, you know, maybe that wasn't the best plan. And the fact that gold standard strict bed rest is, you know, like it's being proven to be the best way for these pressure injuries. So it was a, it was a very much a combined approach by lots of, you know, really passionate um, health professionals and a patient who just really, really wanted to get his life back. And so, um, you know, like it's really happy to, to think that, um, you know, 12 weeks down the track, he is, he's able to spend three hours up in his chair two times a day. And, um, and he feels those are kind of his golden hours. I gave him a call to talk to him about whether or not I could talk about him on the webinar. And he was so excited <laughs> when, um, when I spoke to him. And I guess one of the really exciting things for him is normally I wouldn't be able to talk to him on the phone because he's not a confident English speaker, but um, because he was put into that private hospital environment, um, his English has come, come along and he feels really confident. We were able to have a really good conversation um, on the telephone and he was just so incredibly grateful for all the co combined support that he had. And, um, and he very much gave me goosebumps when he said, it's just so nice that he's finally got his life back. And he's like, um, he's gonna be so good and he's gonna only sit up in his chair for as long as he's been determined to be safe. And um, yeah, and it's, and it's kind of those feel good stories that make it really real for you. And I think that that's why I wanted to share his story because I think that there are a lot of other patients out there that have had these very difficult journeys. And, and it's really about putting, you know, putting your heads together with other health professionals and seeing is there something that you're just not missing, that you're missing that um, could be the difference between him, um, between a wound healing and not healing. And I think that that was, in, in his case, it was done really well and it was such a, a, such a happy ending. And, and to be able to tell the surgeons and everyone that had been involved, everyone was really overwhelmed because he's just such a lovely guy and everyone wanted him to have his happy ending and he has it now. And he's determined to stay healed. And yeah, and it's, it's just really exciting to be part of that, that particular journey. So thank you very much, everybody. I think I've talked under, which is like a miracle for me because I'm a chatty Cathy.
Kira and thank you so much. What a fantastic story that you're able to share with us today. For me, it was um, really interesting to hear you talk about chronic pressure injuries and how they can actually redefine a person. And the real, um, the real importance of having that relationship that you build up with the patient so that then they can disclose things to you because you listen authentically to what they're describing and then you can probe and unpack, no pun intended, unpack the, the what's going on for him which is exactly what happened in this case and then you're able to put in all those wraparounds to support him. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think um, by all accounts, I think Jane's got a few questions. So we've, we've got about um, seven minutes or so. So I'll just hand over to Jane and she'll ask some questions on behalf of the people on the screen. Thank you. Oh, kia, ora, kia ora, Leona and kia ora, Ange. Um, I'll start with a couple of the um, comments that have just come through at the end. So uh, really impressive. Great work. Um, great approach, identifying goals and um, being able to reflect on those. Um, and a couple of other people just saying thank you. Um, the, there is a question about um, asking if you can talk more about the POAC funding and um, whether this was arranged through planning and funding. So it was. Uh, that was something that my colleague had previously done because we identified that there was a real deficit within the art facilities um, they were quite hesitant to take that dressings because they didn't have the patients that were, or they didn't have the nurses that were familiar with it. And quite often there's only one nurse to one rest home and it can take up a lot of, a lot of time. And so it was really about kind of empowering the rest home so that they know that we have worked with the uh, intermed who supply our vacs that would go into the rest homes and support them to learn how to do the dressings from a funding side of things. Um, so it was, uh, POAC is public options for acute health. So it's basically um, the way that we facil the way that we rolled it is basically we could have early supported discharge. So that is how we kind of got the sign off on it is actually these patients don't necessarily need an acute bed, um, that this could be managed in a, in a hospital facility. And so that is how we um, kind of developed that pathway to get that funding because actually it's a patient that could be managed in a public hospital, oh, sorry, in a private hospital or a rest home if they were given the required um, support and, and if they had the funding um, to do it because obviously everyone knows that it's um, funding is, is everything. <laughs> and so when you don't have it, it's, um, you know, like it is really, very difficult. So to be able to, to, be able to develop that pathway, um, I think was really, really important because it meant that um, it meant that everyone was able to just have like a really um, smooth transition into that area. And it meant that it gives, um, we, we developed a, like a pathway so that everyone was kind of on the same page and everyone knew the expectations and um, not all rest homes or private hospitals are ready for um, like to have them. And I mean, that's, and that's okay as well. And so it's really about liaising with the, the rest homes and private hospitals to make sure that it's the right thing for them as well. So uh, that's why it's really important that they come into the hospital and see the wound and see the dressing as well, so they can understand if it actually within the realms of possibility. Um, and, you know, we have it that some of them can't, um, they look at the wounds and they go, nope, they're far too big. I don't think we can manage those. And, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, and we just look for a, an, an alternate um, placement for the patient. So um, yeah, it's it's a, a well utilized um, stream, and I think that it's something that um, you know could be easily implemented in other DHBs because I think it is really beneficial for the patient. Because who really wants to be um, in a hospital when they don't have to be? You know. That kind of segues into my next question. So you talk about pathways and obviously part of that pathway is, is communication and um, multidisciplinary communication across um, different areas of the sector. So um, you said it was a group of passionate professionals involved in his care. Uh, did you have sort of planned regular meetings and, and were there any issues with communication? Um, and um, this case study in particular, how did that enable you to work with like district nursing colleagues to reduce any time for referrals in the future? I guess one of the really good things is that I, I'm an ex-district nurse and so to them I'll always be a district nurse so I'm very approachable 
because, um, you know, like I've worked in that setting and I think that um, in terms of district nursing, they do know that wound care are here and we are constantly approached by uh, the district nurses via emails and uh, referrals. So it's something that's done um, quite well at counties and um, we've actually, they've recently just restructured to actually have their own community wound care nurse. So that's going to be even um, even better for district nursing. So I think um, there were regular meetings. Um, I did a lot of go-between. I did a lot of um, kind of liaising with the different uh, areas just to make sure that it's, um, that everything was working kind of seamlessly. And one of, I guess, one of the most important things was that the whole time the patient was well informed and he knew that everything and he was involved in every single decision and we know that his family was important to him so that there was always someone there for him so that he felt um, you know that he was included in these decisions and we weren't making decisions for him. Cool thank you and um, we do have another couple of questions but I'm aware that there are people who need to head off and um, so I will um, wrap that up there and any other questions obviously we'll send those out with answers afterwards as well. Um, so thank you again, Ange, and I'll pass to Leona. Any further comments from you? Mm, thank you. So uh, at the very end, Ange will close with the karakia, but before we head into that, I would just like to acknowledge her sharing and her willingness today to answer the questions and any other questions that come through. Uh, as Jane says, please remember to send your questions through in the next 24 hours so we can put them to Ange and then get them back out with the video. Um, I'd also like to take the moment to remind you of the inaugural Wound um, Care Week that commences next week. So some of you will know about it, some of you won't, but the Wound Care Society, I'm sure their website will help you um, find your way to that. So that's a, a big moment for them. So we'd like to acknowledge that. Um, thank you to Jane Lester who coordinated the session today and all the intricacies that are involved in recording and making the session available in due course. Uh, there's lots of little things that have to be done that Jane's much better at doing than me. So thank you, Jane, for all of that work. Um, and finally, I'd like to wish you all the very best. Most of all, please stay safe and thank you for joining. Kia kaha. Thank you, Ange. Uh, Kai Pakuru Mai Tipo, Tau Mai Timori, Homie, Huie, Pakie.